Congratulations to the Boston Celtics on winning their 18th NBA championship in franchise history. They are now in sole possession of the record. In today's episode, a Supreme Court ruling likely secures a decades-long sports betting monopoly in the largest state to legalize it. Plus, Sean White is starting a year-round snowboarding league, a former coach is suing LSU, and Derek Jeter sold a palatial estate. It's Tuesday, June 18th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Snowboarding legend Sean White wants to make the sport something people are interested in year-round, not just during the Winter Olympics. White is launching the Snow League, which will start next March and be a year-round tour. It's going to start with five events over a 12-month period with 20 men and 16 women accumulating points over the course of the season, which will carry a $1.5 million prize purse. The Snow League is backed by 76ers and Devils co-owner David Blitzer, Aries Management, and NFL legend Larry Fitzgerald, among others. While there are plenty of snow sport events across the calendar for people who know where to look, White is looking to create sustained interest with the league format so that narratives can carry through over a season. The Snow League is also going to invest in some human interest storytelling to try to get casual fans interested in the various athlete journeys. The league's next big task will be to sign media partners that can work to stoke the kind of fan investment that will make this whole thing tick. Former college football coach Les Miles has filed a lawsuit against LSU, the NCAA, and the National Football Foundation, which oversees the College Football Hall of Fame. Miles is protesting the fact that he is not eligible for the Hall of Fame because LSU vacated 37 wins from 2012 to 2015, when Miles was the team's coach. That move dropped his winning percentage below 600, which is the official threshold for a coach to be considered for enshrinement. However, to be taken seriously in this case, he may have to overcome the reason for the vacated wins and other punishments, which was that an LSU representative was found to have paid over $180,000 over five years to the father of LSU lineman Vidal Alexander. There were also incidents that LSU was punished for that happened after Miles left the university, which included Odo Beckham Jr. giving out cash to LSU players on the field after the 2020 College Football Playoff National Championship. Miles may be looking for some revisionist history now that LSU's violations could essentially be done above board in today's NIL system. The Houston Astros have cut Jose Abreu. From a baseball perspective, the move makes plenty of sense. Abreu wasn't performing, and the team would rather give his at-bats to younger players. However, the move has to sting because the team still owes Abreu $30.8 million after signing the former MVP to a three-year $50 million deal two off-seasons ago. It's the most money the team has ever eaten on a contract. If you are looking for a home in upstate New York with your basic amenities like six bedrooms, 13 bathrooms, five kitchens, one of which is outdoors, a lagoon fed by a small waterfall, boat dock, turrets, an infinity pool shaped like a baseball diamond, you might have missed your chance. The estate fitting that description has been sold by Derek Jeter. The sale process lasted longer than Jeter's tenure as a Marlins executive. The home was initially listed in 2018 for $14.25 million. It was eventually relisted at $6.3 million. We don't yet know the final price. This is not the captain's largest real estate sale. In 2021, he sold his 31,000-square-foot custom-built mansion in Tampa for $22.5 million. I'm joined now by Daniel Wallach, sports betting attorney and co-host of the Conduct Detrimental podcast. Welcome, Daniel. Thanks for having me on today, Owen, in this uh, big news day for sports betting. Yeah, absolutely. So before we get into to the meat of the issue here, uh, let's get some context. So Florida sports betting is operated exclusively by the Seminole tribe in a deal with the state. To start, could you just give us the basic deal with this arrangement? Yeah, the the, the Seminole tribes um, compact, which is governed by federal law, grants uh, the tribe exclusive statewide control over all sports betting, which makes it the, uh, you know, sort of the disconnect between Florida's size, which is the third most populous state being under the thumb of one operator and you contrast that with other states like new jersey where there are more than 40 operators ohio and maryland there are more than 100 so this is one of these anomalous situations that is a byproduct of this federal law known as the indian gaming regulatory act that allow states and tribes to enter into compacts otherwise agreement known as agreements uh to provide for tribal operated gambling on Indian lands. And that's that, that's sort of the, the, the hook behind the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act that it's, it's characteristic 
is that it provides for gaming opportunities on Indian lands only, and it's not intended uh, to, to provide a vehicle for statewide gambling activities. So in order, in order for the Seminole Tribe in the state of Florida to um, try to navigate this federal requirement, uh, they declared in the, in the language of the compact that regardless of where the patron is located, the wager itself is deemed to occur exclusively on tribal land where the computer server processing the bet is located. And, and this would essentially transform Florida into Indian land statewide. If you're, if, if you're a sports better in, in, in Jacksonville or Key Largo, you're deemed to be on Indian land when you're making that bet. And that's the basis on which uh, the, the state of Florida and the Seminole tribe were able to include online sports betting within a federally approved compact. And of course, uh, that, that was immediately challenged in federal court by uh, a competitor of, of the Seminole tribe, uh, West Flagler Associates, which operated uh, Miami High Line, uh, which operates uh, a card room in northern Florida. They're, they're one of the you know, more prominent gaming industry families uh, in the state of Florida. They challenged the compact's online sports betting provisions under federal law by, by asserting that the compact's inclusion of online sports betting violated the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act requirement that the gaming activity take place on Indian lands. And West Flagler was successful in the trial court in Washington, D.C. Federal District Court. Uh, West Flagler prevailed in 2021. And, and, and due to that decision, uh, online sports betting and all sports betting that was otherwise legal stopped for nearly two years while the Seminole Tribe and the Department of Interior were pursuing an appeal uh, in front of the D.C. Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals. That ruling ended up going in favor of the Seminole Tribe and the Department of the Interior. And as a consequence of that ruling, uh, the Hard Rock app resurfaced in Florida and sports betting began anew in, I think, September of 2023, uh, with the only remaining impediment being um, a potential Supreme Court challenge. And that was obviously uh, disposed of today, which leaves the Seminole Tribe in control of statewide sports betting in Florida for the next 31 years or, or until 2051. And it raises the, the specter for iGaming to also be legalized in Florida within the next two years under the same theory that the bet takes place on Indian land where the server is located. And that's one way the Seminole tribe and the, and the, and the, and the, and the governor were able to sidestep. We're also able to sidestep IGRA and Florida law because there's a state constitutional ban on casino gambling outside of tribal lands. So the only way for the state and the tribe to negotiate online gaming was to do it through this compacting process. Yeah, wow. Fascinating, a ton to unpack there. Um, so in terms, if someone's placing a sports bet in Florida on, on their phone, are they doing it through the Hard Rock app or can they contract with, you know, DraftKings, FanDuel and just ha it's all through it's all through Hard Rock? It's all through Hard Rock. It's the, Hard Rock app is the only game in town. Hard Rock is a uh, it's a subsidiary, a wholly owned subsidiary of the Seminole Tribe of Florida. And uh, the compact, which was negotiated between the state and the tribe, would bar the use of other commercially branded websites. So. While, while, while the compact uh, encourages the Seminole tribe to enter into marketing partnerships with the state's 30 or so licensed horse race tracks, dog race tracks, high lie venues, while those companies can partner up with the Seminole tribe, the price for doing so is extremely steep and unfavorable to, to these other gaming operators. Number one, they're gonna have to pay the Seminole tribe a revenue share of 40% of, of, of sports betting revenues. So whatever money um, is, 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 is generated by these other gaming venues, uh, they're gonna have to pay 40% over to the tribe. And because these other entities would be operating as marketing partners of the Seminole tribe, they wouldn't be able to use their own websites. It all would flow through the Hard Rock app. Uh-huh, so it sounds like it's just not worth it. Like even if they could, it's 
like, why it, would it they? Maybe it, it could potentially be viewed as multiple distribution channels because you could bet at the racetrack or you could bet online. But in, in reality, there's only one operator. There's only one price. There's only one set of promotions. And the consumer dispute resolution procedure is essentially non-existent uh, because if the customer has any grievance over how a bet is decided, they've got to take that to the Seminole tribe and it's decided by the, the tribal council. I mean, good luck there. How do you think that's going to turn out? Whereas in other jurisdictions, the state gambling regulatory agencies uh, can get involved and in what has happened in a number of other jurisdictions where companies like FanDuel, BetMGM may have mispriced some of the some of the betting propositions, mistakes. The gaming agencies held the, the, the gaming companies to the to the price that was originally offered and made them pay out on a bet that was obviously uh, a mistake, otherwise known as a culpable, uh, a palpable error. Uh, there are no palpable errors in tribal nation because the house will always win. There's no other recourse. Wow. And, and also the, the market forces that you have in other places that, you know, make, make them offer, you know, big entry offers, you know, if you, if you sign up, you get $200, all that stuff. And, you know, if you, if you don't like the, or however things work with one app, there's a, you know, a dozen mm. others you can switch over to in most States. I assume none of that is present in Florida. There is exactly one, one operator you can work with. Where else, where, else, where else are you going to gamble except the offshore market, which uh, I'm certainly not encouraging, but there's no incentive for um, the Seminole tribe to offer competitive um, promotional inducements that are characteristic of states like, you know, New Jersey, you know, Maryland, Ohio, any multi-operator state when there's a monopoly uh, and it's controlled by one party. I mean, just basic economic supply and demand uh, dictate uh, that fewer customer oriented incentives are going to be featured. I'm not going to say there are, there are going to be none. There are obviously going to be some, but it's going to be on a much smaller scale than what you might see in New Jersey or Michigan, where there are dozens, literally dozens of operators that are competing for customers. And what's, what's in it for the state? It sounds like they're getting something out of this too. Uh, all they're getting, I think from the state's vantage point, the, the selling point is the mon the annual guarantee, right? When, when, when states like, you name it, New Jersey, Michigan, Ohio, Maryland, they pass sports betting laws, they set a tax rate, but no one knows what's going to you know, ultimately be, be, be collected. It's all based on you know, projections. And sometimes the projections uh, you know, are, are, are significantly under uh, the actual performance and sometimes the performance is very wanting. The one thing that tribes can do through the compacting process is grant states uh, annual monetary guarantees. Uh, and in this case, in the, in the Seminole tribes compact with the state of Florida, the, 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 the tribe were able to get uh, the right, the exclusive right to sports betting, uh, the, the exclusive right to craps and table games at their casinos, the right to build three or four more new casinos. I forget what the number is. And uh, in return for that, they, the tribe agree to pay the state of Florida a 13.75% revenue, 13 revenue share on sports betting, but overall are guaranteeing the state of Florida a minimum of $500 million annually that no matter how the actual performance uh, you know, occurs, whether it's higher or lower, at a bare minimum, as a starting point, the state is guaranteed half a, million, half a billion dollars annually from the tribe. In the non-gaming world, that doesn't happen. When New Jersey passed its online sports betting law back in 2018, uh, none of the operators were guaranteeing performance. I think we all knew that the market would, be, would bear out and would do very well in the state, would be among the highest performing states in the country. But it's, it's one thing to project revenues. It's another thing entirely to guarantee it. And that's why the, the Seminole tribe enjoyed a significant competitive advantage in negotiating for online sports betting with the state. And there's also the issue that dates back to a lawsuit about six or seven years ago, where under an earlier compact, 
under which the, the tribe was paying the state over $300 million annually, a federal court held the state to be in breach of that compact uh, because it had allowed uh, some of the racetracks to operate uh, certain kinds of player dealer card games, which looked very much like a house bank game. And following a jury trial, a federal judge in Tallahassee uh, opined that the state of Florida breached the exclusivity provisions of the 2010 compact. And as a consequence, the Seminoles were allowed to stop paying the state even a dollar of, of, of revenues when they had been paying in excess of 300 million annually. So that provided a lot of leverage for the tribe to come back to the state and offer to revive and resurrect these lost revenues, but only if you give us total control over online sports betting. So it, it, you know, when it comes to leverage and hand, to quote Seinfeld, uh, the Seminole tribe had hand, the state and the other operators didn't. Uh -huh. And there's no more legal recourse, right, for West Flagler or anyone else who wants to challenge this. This is the deal until 2051. Uh, you, never say, you never say never in the world of litigation. Uh, as I've highlighted on, on you know, X, formerly known as Twitter, West Flagler still has three judicial avenues remaining. I mean, if the ship has sailed on challenging this compact in federal court under IGRA, but... Um, West Flagler could bring a separate lawsuit in federal court asserting a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the U.S. Constitution on the basis that the state law granting the Seminole tribe a monopoly on the basis of its, of its you know, heritage or alienage uh, violates the equal protection rights of non-tribal gaming stakeholders who are excluded from this lucrative activity. So uh, the equal protection uh, path remains available for West Flagler, and it's worth noting that U.S. Supreme Court Justice Kevin, uh, not Kevin, uh, Brett Kavanaugh uh, has already opined that the state preference given to the Seminole tribe uh, raises serious equal protection concerns. I mean, that's that's like the first. That's going to be the opening, the opening, you know, you know, line in West Flagler's soon to be filed federal court brief. So we're going to go down that avenue. Secondly, uh, West Flagler can use the state court system to claim that the, that, that the state law allowing online sports betting violates the Florida state constitutional prohibition against non-voter approved casino gambling. Uh, you, you, some of your listeners may recall that back in 2018, uh, Florida voters approved an amendment to the state constitution uh, that would limit or restrict the ability of the legislature to pass any casino gambling laws. Uh, so West Flagler could avail themselves of this argument and, and assert that the legalization of sports betting statewide uh, violates the Florida constitutional ban. And the ironic thing about this is that the uh, the constitutional provision that was approved by voters in 2018 was funded largely by the Seminole tribe. The Seminole tribe advocated for this restriction on, on legislative ability in order to um, secure and cement their statewide gaming monopoly. So Les Flagler could challenge uh, this law in federal court by using the constitutional provision that, that, that uh, the Seminole tribe had advocated for. And then third, um, this decision that was handed down by an intermediate appellate, appellate court, the D.C. Circuit's ruling, which was uh, not taken up by the Supreme Court, that ruling serves as a basis for a new federal agency rule passed by the Department of the Interior, which applies across the country and, and states that uh, tribes can now have Internet gaming in their compacts. Uh, the D.C. Circuit's ruling by itself was not enough to have general applicability to tribes all across the country. So if a tribe in California wanted to take advantage of the D.C. Circuit's decision allowing for Internet gaming in a compact, there's the question of whether the D.C. Circuit's ruling would have any binding effect in a California federal court. So that's why the Department of the Interior made this a rule of general applicability to tribes in every state. So uh, West Flagler or potentially another gaming operator can challenge that new rule in a federal district court action, alleging that the Department of the Interior essentially rewrote the IGRA statute 
to, uh, to provide for internet and off-reservation gaming when the focus, the sole focus of the federal law was on in-person gambling on Indian land. So there could be a backdoor challenge to the, on the IGRA issue, but instead of challenging this compact under federal law, it would be challenging the broader rulemaking by the Department of the Interior, which had relied on the DC Circuit's decision. So uh, there'll be plenty of billable hours remaining in this controversy should West Flagler elect to continue the battle. And it remains to be seen whether they have the, the, the stamina, wherewithal, stomach, or war chest to fund three, two, or even you know one lawsuit that could continue on for a few years. At some point, I'm not saying you run out of money, but you begin to assess the odds. And from West Flagler's vantage point, the, the best case they ever had was the case that they just lost on. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, and yeah, the, the precedent of the transaction happens where the server is, is I think it's either going to get challenged again at some point, or it's going to, it's going to have some wide reaching consequences one way or the other. Oh, and you, you, you hit the nail on the head. There are going to be, there are going to be tribes in other states that are going to run with this decision and seek to have new or amended compacts providing for internet gaming. And those compacts in those other states are going to be challenged by the West Flaglers of those states. And you're going to see, you're going to see copycat compacts as well as uh, identical litigations that are filed in other circuits. Uh, and the question over whether IGRA allows for the compacting of internet-based wagering, that's a question that ultimately will be resolved by the U.S. Supreme Court in, in a future battle down the road. I mean, the ship has sailed on the West Flagler dispute, but there will be other points of entry in other states involving compacts negotiated with other tribes. So I think the controversy ensues and the books haven't been closed yet on the question of whether tribes can have compacts that allow internet gaming. Uh, we could be a few years away from a decision, but ultimately as, as tribes seek to leverage the outcome in the West Flagler case, that does raise the prospect of future court challenges uh, utilizing the same arguments that West Flagler raised, albeit in a different circuit which is not beholden to the DC circuit's ruling. And yeah, just quickly on those lines. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about California now where sports betting is not legal, but, and there were two attempts to make it legal, I believe in 2022 through the, the ballot process. One of those was working through the tribes. And um, I'm wondering if this precedent could, um, yeah, could, could affect how things work in the most populous state in the, in the nation. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, that is the uh, holy grail. California represents the holy grail of sports betting markets. No question. As, as much scale as can be generated by New York, New Jersey, or Florida, they pale in comparison to a state that has 40 million residents, 19 professional sports teams. That's, that's the big ticket item. And, and today's uh, outcome uh, improves the prospects and accelerates the timeline for online sports betting legalization in California. And, and just hear me out on this. I think the one benefit is obviously the tribe, the tribes in California do not want to go back to the electorate so quickly after an online sports betting proposal was rejected by more than 80% of voters. So even, even without uh, opposition, um, a tribal initiated ballot proposal would face uncertain prospects before voters, at least in the near term, like 2026. What today's outcome allows is it provides a path for California Indian tribes to uh, secure online sports betting through an amended compact, as opposed to seeking an amendment to the state constitution through voter approval. Uh, theoretically, um, the, tribe, the tribes in California can avoid the costs, the monumental costs, as well as the uncertainty and result of pursuing a ballot initiative. And they could accomplish through the compacting process what they're probably leery of doing through the ballot initiative process. So you could see, uh, you know, it takes two to tango. Yeah, I mean, it's not so much that the tribes in California want it, but the governor and the, the legislative branch have to sign off on it. And, but assuming that they do, 
it's a way to bypass the voters and avoid the risk that California voters will turn down the next online sports betting ballot proposition. So if the tribe wanted to wait until 2028 uh, before presenting online sports betting to the voters, now they don't have to wait that long. They could, they could go back and pursue uh, negotiations and discussions with Governor Newsom and potentially have uh, new compacts that allow online sports betting. And if, we're, if, if it were approved by the state legislature, that could take place. That that could come into come to fruition within two years, without having to wait until 2028. So, uh, two schools of thought on that. The California Constitution has very restrictive language about the types of gambling that the state legislature can 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 allow. Uh, the main provision prevents the state legislature from authorizing casinos of the type existing in Nevada and 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 and, 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 and uh, New Jersey. Uh, in my view, and I've written a law review article detailing this analysis, uh, in my view, iGaming would require a ballot initiative. Sports betting wouldn't. So if the California tribes want to operate online sports betting as expeditiously as possible, I mean, it's their prerogative whether they want to pursue this, but if they do pursue it, there's a path for legalizing it without necessitating a ballot initiative, which would save the tribes hundreds of millions of dollars as potentially, I mean, I'm not certain that um, an initiative would cost that much money with advertising, given that the commercial gaming operators would likely not want to oppose it. Uh, but it would it would avoid the uncertainties surrounding a, a ballot measure, which if the results came anywhere close to what happened in 2022, it wouldn't it wouldn't have a shot in 2026. The compacting route provides a path, at least for the next two years, that can accelerate the advent of online sports betting in California. So that's, that's a jurisdiction to watch closely, and that would be a game changer. Yeah, absolutely. Daniel Locke, really interesting stuff. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me, Owen. I've always been a big fan of your work and of front office sports, and it was a, it's my pleasure. That's it for today. We will be off tomorrow for Juneteenth, but back at it after that. Thanks for listening. We will see you on Thursday.